Um, so because this is the second panel that I'm moderating, I will not um, offer introductory remarks at risk of repeating myself. Um, I think there are lots of issues already on the table. Um, and as you'll see, we may be moving slightly from more theoretical first principles questions to the more particular applications perhaps, or some kind of trade-offs in practice of how different proposals and different standards might um, come head to head against one another. Um, so uh, the first panelist that I will introduce today is Eric Posner. He's a professor here at the University of Chicago um, and also a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and I will, I mean, you can refer to the bios um, and yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, my claim here, I'm going to make two claims. Claim number one is that the consumer welfare standard has no foundation in merger law. I'm going to focus on merger law just because I know it better than other areas of antitrust law. Um, now, um, what is this based on? Well, it's based on the language of the statute. The statute says that mergers are forbidden if they substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Uh, that says nothing about consumer welfare. Um, I realize that Herb disagrees with this. I just learned that a few minutes ago. But to take an ex the extreme example, a merger to monopoly, two firms merging to one, uh, who, because let's say it's, it's a natural monopoly, results and there's uh, ex uh, a high level of efficiencies, results in a lower price, I'm pretty confident that no court would approve that merger. Uh, if anybody has any evidence to the contrary, I'd love to hear that. Um, uh, but that would satisfy the consumer welfare standard. So the question is, why do people think that, um, that merger law uh, reflects, that the consumer welfare standard uh, characterizes uh, merger law? And I'd say the same thing about a three to two uh, merger, or really any merger. Okay. Nor is it the case that the courts have changed the law. So a lot of people get, have gotten angry with the Supreme Court for um, you know, changing antitrust law over the last few decades. But it hasn't uh, said anything about merger law since the 1960s and early 1970s. And in its uh, famous merger cases, it more or less uh, just parrots the language of Section 7 with various um, uh, elaborations and says pretty clearly that a merger that uh, results in lower prices will not necessarily be approved. Uh, so, uh, nor have uh, the lower courts endorsed a consumer welfare standard for mergers. Although the lower courts are a lot less clear than the uh, Supreme Court, and I'll come back to that uh, point in a moment. Also, the consumer welfare standard is not the same as what I'll call the competition standard, as other people have, the standard that's actually in Section 7. However, there are, in some of these unclear judicial opinions, some hints that they are actually the same. Um, that, in fact, as one court puts it, the so-called economic conception of competition embodies the consumer welfare standard. So I don't think that makes any sense. There is an economic conception of consumer welfare, which is just the consumer surplus. And there are various economic models that are used to try to understand competition. And they're obviously not the same thing. So we have a mystery here, which is why do so many people claim that the correct standard for evaluating mergers is consumer welfare? So um, now, uh, I think most people here more or less know the answer. But um, I've spent a long time, way too long, trying to get to the bottom of this. And the place to um, start is, of course, with uh, Williamson, and um, I'll spare you the, uh, the diagram. I don't actually have any slides, but. So Williamson's article has been uh, cited at least 2,000 times, according to Google. Uh, I, I doubt it's ever been read. I mean, maybe it was read, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Um, the actual trade-off, what he calls the naive trade-off, and, and he meant naive. He was, he was being um, self-conscious about this. That is two pages long. And then 
There's a very much longer section of the article, which is about 10 pages long, which is called Qualifications. Now, the naive uh, trade-off model is just, the, is just efficiency. He, so what, as he says in various publications, he was in the Justice Department at the time. You know, like Socrates, he goes around asking these lawyers, uh, uh, you know, what are you doing? How do you decide whether to challenge a merger? Like Socrates' interlocutors, the lawyers say, oh, we don't know. And so uh, Williamson says, well, I'm an economist, so I think, so let me think about this. And he says, oh, well, you should challenge a merger if it's inefficient, if the deadweight loss is greater than uh, the cost savings. And that's his naive model. But then he actually acknowledges that that's not what the law is. And he goes on and he talks about all the reasons why the law is different. And he points out that uh, Congress, in enacting and reenacting uh, Section 7 of the Clayton Act, was concerned about all kinds of things, corporate power, uh, the distribution of wealth, uh, what Williamson calls social discontent, which you know in the 19th century meant things like you know corporations hiring people to beat up uh, workers, and today means you know <laughs> <laughs> you know pick your example, okay. So people, you know, people, the public, people don't like big corporations. I mean, they like, you know, the, the cheap goods and, and high quality goods, but they, they are uncomfortable all frequently with uh, large corporations. We all understand this. And Williamson, in this qualification section, talks about how there are all kinds of ways that uh, could be legitimately, you know, all kinds of methods that could be legitimately used to address these problems. And he just says, look, this is not part of my efficiency uh, test, but he doesn't say there's anything illegitimate about them. In fact, in fact, he says at one point that maybe the top 100 firms in the country just shouldn't be allowed to merge at all, period, because of the political implications of those mergers. Okay. Interestingly, by the way, in the I.O. literature, which I've, you know, skimmed a little bit, Williamson's, you know, efficiency test, which is not the consumer welfare test, that's what the economists you know, use in their, in their models of uh, mergers and industrial organization generally, because that's what economists think about. That's, you know, efficiency is their normative benchmark. When you look at the qualifications, the thing that jumps out at you and what Williamson understood as well as, you know, anybody, what people don't like about big corporations is not just that they raise prices sometimes if they have market power, but they hurt people who are not actually their customers. Right, this is you know the non-consumer welfare effect of corporate power. So it could be political, it could be social. Um, uh, uh, those are the um, the qualifications. Okay, second stage is our friend Bork. Bork, as everybody knows, as Herb has pointed out, Bork uh, makes two contributions. He he uh, he just takes Williamson's efficiency test and mislabels it a consumer welfare standard. The other thing he does is he dismisses all of the qualifications. He says they don't matter. Uh, he says in the antitrust paradox, you know, if um, you know if, if they matter, Congress can pass legislation to address them ignoring the fact that Congress actually did pass legislation to address them. That was Section 7 of the Clayton Act. Um, and so uh, after Bork, everybody ignores uh, the qualifications. Okay. At some point over the next uh, 20 years, 30 years, um, all of this um, enters into agency practice. And you see it become more and more a part of the merger guidelines. And, uh, and you can see it in various agency documents, including there are lots of, for example, for those of you who don't know, like summaries that agencies publish of, of what they do. Um, at some point, the, 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 the falsely labeled consumer welfare standard becomes a real consumer welfare standard. I, I'd like to know how exactly this happened, but I think it must be that lawyers at some point, uh, or maybe the economists and the agencies realized that you couldn't just use an efficiency test and so the, the, total, the producer surplus was dropped and only consumer uh, surplus is, is used. Otherwise, you know, you would be allowing all kinds of mergers that resulted in um, a greater concentration. Um, 
the, I think the real you know, changes occur in the 1997 merger guideline revisions and especially the 2010 merger guidelines. So what happens is, you, especially in the 2010 merger guidelines, you can see this in, the, in language throughout the guidelines. All of the guidelines have talked about market power as being the unifying theme, as they put it. But by the 2010 merger guidelines, market power is defined to mean, or understood to mean, basically price, the impact on consumers. Whereas market power, as you know, is a broader term than that. Um, so for example, as I was talking about with, with Herb, it's possible for a merger to uh, result in a, higher, in, in a higher market power, but a lower price. So there's this wedge that's uh, introduced. The efficiency defense or rebuttal becomes more and more robust as the guidelines uh, proceed. And by the time of the 2010 guidelines, it's made clear that the, mer that the agencies are not going to challenge mergers that produce uh, efficiencies such that the price will go down. Um, and there are, I found, um, documents in which uh, the agencies say that the FTC, for example, at least in one case, declined to challenge a merger to monopoly because it believed that uh, it would result in a lower price. So it's really basically not enforcing the law, in, in my view. Okay, finally, the courts. So what are the courts doing? I think the courts are basically confused. But, I, but the best evidence I can, th I can think of, for my view, is the Anthem case. Because in the Anthem case, the dissenting judge, then Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, quite clearly adopted a consumer surplus or price test, as I like to put it. He said, look, the merger is going to lower prices. Put the monopsony stuff to the side. So therefore, it should be approved. And the majority says, well, the merger is anti-competitive. So it can't be, it should not be approved. The problem is, is the majority didn't really explain what it meant by anti-competitive. And it starts talking about the kind of consumer effects um, and it just kind of peter, peters out into a, a word salad. So this is a characteristic of the cases where the focus is often on prices, maybe you know, uni almost uniformly on prices, but the courts speak in terms of competition. So it's a little unclear what's actually going on in a lot of these cases. OK, let me just conclude now, because I'm out of time. Um, the main objection to the consumer welfare standard is that it ignores the uh, impact of market power or declining competition on everybody that is except for the consumers. Um, and the intention of Congress is clearly embodied in the statute was to go after declining competition caused by mergers because of, their, of the general social and political effects, which have been a huge part of American history since the very beginning. There's no, uh, there's no you know, basis for abandoning uh, Congress's uh, goal, especially because uh, even if you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to some economists, it's, it's reasonably plausible. And it's uh, something that uh, people are concerned about today. The remedy that um, now I would propose, it's part, partly it's going back to the structural presumption and the HHI tests, but I do think that it's a little uh, uh, naive to, to think that the courts are going to accept that, partly because so much of the economic literature uh, expresses hostility to market definition in general and the HHI tests. And because economists, as I read the literature, seem to be very skeptical about assumptions that markets are homogenous. So if we're moving toward upward pricing pressure and structural models, if that's really what's going to happen, and I expect it will continue to happen because courts have gotten used to them, then the proper statistic is not price, but um, margin, which is, a, which is a better reflection of uh, market power. And with that, I will stop. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. So we're now, now moving to the panelist directly on my left, Stephen Salop. He's an economist and a lawyer, um, professor emeritus. Okay. Well, a professor emeritus at Georgetown University's Law Center. Um, and um, in the past, he's been an associate director in the Bureau of Economics of the FTC, as well as an economist um, at the Civil Aeronautics Board and at the Federal um, Reserve. So 
Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, following Christina, I want to start with my credentials. Uh, I, I've been deep in the Annie Bork trenches uh, at least since 1980. Uh, this included organizing the FTC's conference on strategy, predation, and antitrust in 1980 that began to create the post-Chicago uh, approach to uh, law and economics. Um, indeed, my Republican colleague at the time of that conference, a guy named Jim DeLong, Brad's father, uh, to let you know how long ago this was, uh, <laughs> As Jim DeLong said, boy, Steve, this work really is an answer to Bork. You should pursue it. And so we did. Um, the goal, so that's kind of my credentials. Where am I today? Um, the goal of my work today is, is to find the happy medium between the Neo-Brandeisians and the post-Chicagoans. I'm not going to try to do the happy medium between Chicago and the rest of the world. That's impossible. Uh, as we learned from Frank Easterbrook last night. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on just a narrow piece, which is a big issue for the Neo-Brandeisians, that might be called vertical, vertical coercion. Okay, so vertical coercion is powerful dominating firms using that power to uh, exer ex to exercise power over smaller counterparties, whether the counterparties are workers, whether the counterparties are small input suppliers, or whether the counterparties are, uh, are, are downstream firms. So this, is, this has been a real animating force for the Neo-Brandeisians, and, and really for me, in my own Raising Rivals Cost work, has all been about powerful firms exercising market power. Now, for those who are asking what I mean by powerful dominating firms, as we're going to see in, in, in the next slide if I get to it, is there are firms with either classical monopsony or classical mo substantial market power, monopsony power, market power, substantial bargaining power, let me start over. Either monopsony, substantial market power, what we call monopoly power, or dominating uh, bargaining power. So I'm going to later on embed this in, an, in a uh, Nash bargaining model. So the, the idea is that uh, to build standards to benefit workers and small firms, but while not harming downstream consumers. Okay, so, uh, you know. Some people are rolling their eyes at this point, neo-Brandeisians. Note that while the consumer welfare standard may be dead, we should still count consumer welfare. I mean, consumers still count, even, even if they're not going to be the overwhelming or uh, sole purpose. So for what it's worth, I've named my standard uh, the Reasonable Competitive Conduct Standard, RCC. Um, that both follows the... Uh, Spirit of the Sherman Act, which is all about reasonable conduct, and it also is just another permutation of R, C, and C. Uh, so uh, we have a couple more permutations to go. Fiona Scott Morton has the CRR standard, uh, contracts that, re that uh, reference rivals. So we're slowly getting to all, all the permutations of R, R, and, uh, and C. So, um, I'm not thrilled, you know, except for the initials, I'm not thrilled with the name of my standard. I mean, uh, the names of all the standards are not self-defining. Uh, they're, they're more like slogans than, uh, th th than, really sta than really standards. The real work, the real work is defining the legal standards for specific categories of conduct. That, that, that's what we really need to do. And, you know, a lot of people have been saying that in this conference, and uh, Judge Wood said it, Eleanor Fox said it yesterday, Carl Shapiro said it yesterday. That's what we need to be looking at. So it's not the mushy slogan of protecting competition or competitive process or whatever. It's all about, well, what are the standards going to be when the rubber hits the road? And so that, that's what I've tried to do with respect to the conduct of these powerful dominating firms. So my, my first three, the first three prongs up there, uh, they skew post-Chicago, and they can all be reached within the context of current antitrust law, just by tightening up current antitrust law. The fourth one uh, skews neo-Brandeisian, 
And I think for that one, you need to have an antitrust exemption. You, you can't do it under, uh, under current antitrust law. That's, that's why I've put it in red, uh, just, just to flag it. So the last one's also the newest. And uh, you know, so ho hopefully I'll have enough time to, uh, to, talk, to talk about it in this first, in this first part. So let me, qu let me quickly talk about, uh, talk, talk about these others. So first, I reject cross-market balancing. Uh, you cannot offset harm within the relevant market by saying there are benefits outside the relevant market. And uh, that is in merger law in Philadelphia National Bank. Uh, that, that is the law in merger law. Uh, it's a little less clear in other areas of the law. Uh, Le that's what Legion does. I think that's what the ancillary restraints doctrine does, really. Um, I ask, you may have remembered, I asked Judge Wood and Judge Easterbrook last night whether they thought that out-of-market uh, benefits should be allowed to trump within market competitive harms. Uh, not surprising to me, Judge Wood agreed, but somewhat surprising to me, Judge Easterbrook also agreed. Uh, uh, I, w I would have thought he's a diehard uh, aggregate efficiency guy. He would certainly be willing to sell out consumer, sell out workers for the benefit of uh, of consumers. Um, so second, second point is my concern with domination, with dominating firms, leads me to recommend more interventionist standards for exclusionary conduct. So this is basically raising rivals' costs. So exclusivity with input suppliers. Uh, uh, conditional rebates, uh, MFNs, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so this is conduct that, uh, in the simplest case, in the simplest case of input foreclosure, raises the cost of rivals and gives the firm power downstream. What I call power over price, uh, but it's really gross gross consumer uh, welfare harm from increased market power. So what I, what I would propose there is greater use of anti-competitive presumptions, lower burden of proof on the plaintiff, and higher rebuttal burden on the, uh, on the defendant. Okay. At the same time, I would not say exclusive should be per se illegal, rather just a strong anti-competitive presumption if a firm with a lot of market power does exclusivity. But gee, not exclusivity with some single small firm, it's going to have to be exclusivity with with a number of firms, so that you can, um, tr tr so that you can reasonably draw a presumption that it's likely to harm consumers. Okay, I require harm to consumers. Now you could say, geez, if if, ra if rivals' costs are sufficiently raised, we can maybe infer harm to consumers. Well, if you you could certainly draw an inference in the sense of a high likelihood. But I'm not willing to draw an automatic inference. I, I think a prong of the test is that you also have to show consumer harm. Efficiencies in principle could offset the consumer harm. Uh, and I'd allow a rebuttal there, but it's, it's going to be a, uh, a, heavy, a heavy rebuttal. Okay, so I'm not protecting the small firms automatically here, uh, but I'm making it harder for the dominant firm to uh, to, har to harm the uh, to harm the small rivals, and you know we, we can talk about whether I'm being too weak uh, too weak on that. Uh, third, I favor more interventionist merger standards. Uh, I'd actually like to see a return to something like Philadelphia National Bank. Philadelphia National Bank, once the uh, once the plaintiff showed the uh, market shares and concentration to satisfy the structural presumption. The burden shifted to the merging parties to make a clear showing that the merger would not harm competition. Not a burden of production, but a burden of proof, and a high burden of proof. And you know that's Supreme Court law, opinion written by uh, Eric's father, I would add, uh, when he was a clerk. And it was, however, weakened in the Baker Hughes decision by now Justice uh, Thomas. Uh, when he was on the when he was on the D.C. Circuit, so I'd like to see a return to uh, to uh, to that. I'd like to see stronger anti-competitive presumptions. Fiona Scott Morton and I have suggested reducing the HHI threshold back to the 1992 level, having an explicit presumption based on guppies. Uh, excuse me, uh, 
an explicit presumption based on uh, acquisition of a maverick. Uh, and um, I think I got one other. Uh, well, that, that, that's, a, that's enough for now. I would not recommend explicitly saying we should protect inefficient competitors. I, you know, I, I don't think it, that would benefit democracy, frankly. I mean, if you do not permit mergers that benefit consumers, that's not good for, for democracy either. I mean, the rise of populism today is partly from the fact that, that people are not making as much money and they're upset about it. So I would rather uh, benefit um, weak competitors by subsidizing them directly. So I think that post-Chicagoans would agree with these three. The last one they they may have more pro they would have more problems with, and of course the Sherman Act has got more problems with. So the fourth one is I would like to see an anti-competitive exemption allowing small participants to form associations that I call joint negotiation entities to collectively bargain with powerful dominating firms. And I what I do is I want to limit the I want to limit them to only have moderate bargaining power, have some bright lines to limit, to make it impossible for them to get real monopoly power, give them only moderate bargaining power. And what I can show in my Nash bargaining model is when you do that, it not only benefits the workers or the small input suppliers, but it also benefits downstream consumers. There's no conflict between uh, downstream consumers and the uh, and the input suppliers. The way it works as follows. So if you start with the firm monopsony point, suppose you, you, you believe that, that, it was, that the firm has got total bargaining power. In a Nash bargaining model, we're, and think about this as, the wor as workers against the firm, if the employer's got total bargaining power in the Nash bargaining uh, model and the worker supply curve is upward sloping, the outcome is the classical monopsony point. By contrast, if the workers had total bargaining power, the outcome would be the monopoly point. But if you start with monopsony and just give the workers a moderate amount of bargaining power, you're going to move up the supply curve. So my bargaining model is they just negotiate over the wage, and then the level of employment is set by market forces. So the wage goes up. The firm would like to hire a lot more workers. It would like to be on its demand curve if it, did, if it weren't worried about monopsony. But more, a few more workers would be willing to work at the higher wage. So you move up the labor supply curve. That means the output of the firm typically goes up. If the output goes up, typically the uh, downstream price will go down. Hence, downstream consumers will benefit. So this, if you, if the, as long as you keep the, um, as long as, as long as you keep um, the level of bargaining power below dominance by the joint negotiating entity, output's going to rise, and downstream consumers are going to benefit. And so that's why I want to keep it at, uh, at moderate. So let me just show you one. This is the other. This technical picture. Um, it's in my. It, this is on my website. Uh, as, we, as we say, as the bargaining power of the JNE goes up, uh, it, the wage rate or the input price goes up to the competitive level. It sits there for a while as bargaining power goes up. It's because the utility, uh, you know, the, the, the utility uh, frontier of the two firms has got a kink at the competitive level. One more, one more minute. And then it goes up some more. But the more important thing is look what happens to sales. That's what happens to employment. It goes up and then stays at the competitive level for a while, and then it starts to fall. And so what you want to do is make sure you don't get into that high-end region, because that's where consumers are going to be on Downstream consumers are going to be happy. But before you get to that point, the, the, counter, the powerful counterparty is upset, but everybody else gains. OK, so to be continued. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, okay, so now two co-authors, um, and we're slightly running out of time, so I would recommend um, going fast if possible. Um, so Bennett Capers is uh, the John 
Fiorek, Research Professor of Law and Director of the Center on Race, Law, and Justice at Fordham Law School. Um, works on antitrust and many other things. And Greg Day is an assistant professor at the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. He also has an appointment at the law school and is a visiting um, fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale, like me. <laughs> um, I let you speak now. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So I, I guess in the sake of time, I'll try to imitate a podcast that you turned on to double the speed and, and I'll speak as fast as I can. Uh, just So for starters, and we're going to split our time, so I'll try to uh, keep this one in three and a half minutes or so. But uh, so we proposed a community, uh, community welfare standard, which uh, I, I want to start just highlighting it's restrained, I think, because I mean, we're definitely trying to stay with inside the bounds of the Sherman Act, where we talked about you know, where the Sherman Act is limited to trade and commerce and competition. And so that's ultimately our goal. The only place that we're really trying to unravel a little bit is just this assumption about how communities experience anti-competitive effects in sort of the same way. And there's a very logical assumption that when, if, say, the price of, if, if Coke monopolized the market and raise and doubles prices, I mean, there's a logical assumption that we'd all suddenly be paying twice as much, you know, as a sort of a broad-based consumer base. And just same if, if Coke said, well, now that we have a monopoly, you know, we don't have to worry about quality anymore, and there'd be a logical assumption that quality would go down for absolutely uh, everyone. So a lot of our goal is actually to highlight the areas where that, that assumption doesn't really hold any longer, where there's, uh, where there's disproportional effects, but not even just randomly distributed, but oftentimes levied disproportionately on communities of color or more vulnerable communities. Um, and so the goal is not, to say, to make uh, antitrust into a uh, unique sort of anti-discriminatory regime, but just to highlight how anti-competitive effects do levy disproportional uh, uh, effects on communities that really an the antitrust regime is currently ill-equipped to understand or has refused to understand. Um, I think, so a great example is uh, Christopher Leslie wrote a really fun, a really good article uh, just last year in the California Law Review that highlights food deserts. And, and a big part of that was saying that mergers amongst grocery stores, you know, have in a lot of areas increased efficiency, but they've also rendered food deserts. And as you probably know, food deserts are not just randomly distributed across the United States, but they are disproportionately and exclusively, essentially, uh, uh, located in poor urban areas. And without, when, as grocery stores you know, flee due to mergers, as research has found, you know, it's, it's left us with, with dollar stores and, 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 and left these uh, certain communities more likely to buy um, uh, the prepackaged, less nutritious foods. And similar, in the same vein, Jeremy Kress wrote a really good article in the Duke Law Journal last year uh, that, that talked about banking antitrust. And, and, a, and a big facet of that, that that he found was through banking mergers uh, that when, when banks have, have retrenched, a lot of times it's not randomly distributed. Oftentimes you could even find efficiencies in more affluent areas, but at the same time uh, you're seeing banking deserts where uh, more vulnerable communities are, are relying upon check cashing stores and tidal ponds. And in, in fact, even when a lot of people in, in uh, disadvantaged communities do have bank accounts, they have to travel, you know, take a bus you know, 30 minutes away to get a bank account, then they have to use uh, uh, high high uh, high fee ATM machines in like bodegas and gas stations as as, as their their singular uh, uh, source. And so, when it comes to things like a lot of these mergers, uh, for instance, there there is the proposed merger between Albertson and Kroger, which I, I have not investigated it, so I can't tell you whether you know it's actually good or bad. But it promises a lot of efficiencies. It would create one of the largest, uh, 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 but. A lot, of, a lot of experts are sounding alarms that this would will increase the rate of food deserts. So the question is, is like, how do a lot of these anticom effects uh, 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 disperse amongst different communities in different ways? And we should jettison this, this idea that like, we will all pay the same high prices when, when prices go up, instead of understanding how efficiencies and inefficiencies are, are, are spread out. Um, and there's a lot of other ways that, that other examples like healthcare is a similar one uh, where we even show things like, like where we talk about like things like switching costs are generally higher. But sometimes if you are more an affluent patient and even if rates go up a bit, a lot of times your insurance will cover it or will get passed on. But if you are an uninsured uh, person from a more vulnerable community, you're more likely to self-medicate and an extreme amount of people in the United States every year go without healthcare because of prices. 
Uh, and so you see that, that there's a natural level, there's a natural higher switching cost uh, across communities. So, sort of, so in our proposal, um, you know, the goal isn't to be sort of the last word uh, on, on what should occur, but we really just wanted to, to propose community welfare center as a way of just sort of starting a new discussion about uh, disaggregating consumers and understanding how different consumers can experience effects differently and whether the, the current standards is too much of a numbers game where sort of like majorities take precedent over uh, sort of minority numbers. So um, I come to this as the odd man out at this conference. Um, I don't teach antitrust. I've never practiced antitrust. I've never taken an antitrust course. Um, and it was kind of a lecture to sort of say I write in the area of antitrust. Literally, I've co-authored one article with Greg. Uh, <laughs> and, and he was the antitrust person. I was sort of bringing a critical race theory perspective to antitrust. Um, but I think one benefit is it allowed me sort of an outsider's perspective. So it was very easy for me to look at sort of the consumer welfare standard, at least as it's commonly understood, and sort of its connection to Robert Bork, and just think like, wow, that's kind of weird that that's what you guys sort of latch onto. <laughs> um, so um, obviously, as Greg pointed out, much of our concern in our article, you know, here, right here, um, is about racial effects and inequality. Um, especially when you think about consumers writ large, which by definition is going to be indifferent to how people of color and uh, poor people might be differently situated and might have higher switching costs, for example. Um, so, you know, what I want to do in my time, since we're pressed for time, is actually sort of switch from talking about race to just talking about the consumer welfare standard uh, more generally. Because um, it seems to me, um, that beyond race, it sort of at least strikes me, and I think maybe us, uh, strikes me as weird to reduce consumer welfare to consumer economic welfare. Um, two words to me stand out. Uh, first, consumer. Like even if we add labor, as several speakers mentioned yesterday and obviously today, that still seems limited. It seems like we only care about people as consumers or people as laborers, uh, but not people as people. Um, so I'm assuming the houseless persons I passed by on my way to the hotel last night are neither really consumers nor laborers, um, but I care about them. And it seems strange to have a standard that writes them out of the picture entirely. Uh, second, the word welfare, since for the most part, this standard seems to use welfare as a proxy for economic welfare. But isn't that too limiting as well? Like, you know, if a transaction results in most or even all consumers paying you know, a few pennies less, but also results in blight or, or houselessness or weakens uh, democratic power or any other non-price harm, shouldn't that count in the welfare analysis as well? Um, so that's why we advocate uh, for community welfare standard, which sort of seems capacious enough uh, to take into account how differently situated people, um, such as you know, people of color and minorities, might be impacted by transaction, um, but also compatious enough to take into account uh, you know, what I think should be the goal of almost every law, which is making society better off, not just some members of society. Um, so I think I'm going to end there. I think the only other thing I'll say, if I have 30 seconds, is uh, since I'm an outsider, and this is my first antitrust conference, uh, hopefully not my last. I've been having a blast. This is so much fun. So, you know, it really is a big tent. Thank you. Thank you to all four panelists. Um, so I think what I'll do, because we're running out of time, is I'll ask one question of all of our panelists, and then I will open it up for questions uh, from the audience. So. Um, I guess my question is, um, since you're not all lawyers, but you all have appointments in law schools, um, I'm going to ask you to put your advocate hat on and um, somehow argue for your proposal and against each other's, or at least one, <laughs> one of the other's uh, proposals. Electra, this, this feels like a game show. <laughs> right. And, you, and it's also allowed to comment on the prior panel's proposals as well. So um, you are free to comment on any alternatives, but um, you have to defend your own. 
Okay. And uh, can I, one more rule is, if possible, concrete examples that show that your standard is better than an alternative would be great. And uh, maybe we should start with Stephen Salop. Well, I, I want to start with what I agree with uh, about their paper. I mean, if a merger of supermarkets creates a food desert, uh, you should be going after the FTC, not after the consumer welfare standard, because the consumer supermarket market definitions are normally drawn very narrowly, and the consumers living in that narrow area constitute, sorry, they constitute a relevant market under standard antitrust, and uh, that merger should not have been, should not have been permitted. Uh, so, um, and if it is, that, that's a problem with conventional antitrust, uh, not, not, not with anything uh, very complicated. Um, beyond that, uh, geez, I don't think Eric and I disagree that much, except that he wants to use margin, which is the wrong measure, instead of price. <laughs> uh, but all the rest, you know, that, that, I, I believe that's a detail. I, I believe that's a detail. I think we, we, mainly, we mainly agree. Uh, who I disagree with is uh, perhaps Tommaso, who I think uh, <laughs> is, cr is, cr is trying to create uh, conclusive presumptions instead of, he, he's making it a little too hard with his presumptions. Uh, but otherwise, I pretty much agree with him as well. Um, hmm. uh, I also, I, I think the, the uh, emphasis on switching costs is very important and, and something I've also been thinking about um, in, uh, in thinking about labor markets also where switching costs are much higher typically than for consumers and, and in this idea of disaggregating different types of people. Uh, I, I think that's, that's very important. I, I do think actually it does fit within, um, you know, the general methods that are, that are used in antitrust law but hasn't hasn't been the focus of either plaintiffs or um, or, the, or government agencies, at least as much as it, sh it should be. So um, I don't know whether you need a different standard for that, at least for that uh, aspect of um, of your uh, proposal. Um, I think Steve and I uh, disagree, uh, <laughs> and that Tommaso and I agree. <laughs> I think, but um, uh, uh, so. That you know, to put my advocate hat on. So uh, you know, the statute says um, lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. That's all I need. It's the statute, uh, and then these various courts that have um, uh, looked at the statute uh, interpret uh, the statute that talks about competition as as meaning competition. So I think I've I've pretty good um, um, legal basis for my view, and one of the one of the points I'm trying to make is that. I think that economists, and, and I mean this, uh, I don't want to uh, attack economists because I think that Williamson, uh, I don't know about Bork, but I think Williamson and, and the economic literature that has followed him have been um, operating in completely good faith in trying to understand what is the proper normative approach to evaluating mergers. But I don't think it's the approach that Congress adopted and incorporated into, this, into the statute. And I think courts have uh, understood this, but I don't think the I think the agencies have been influenced more by the economic approach than by and have lost sight of what the uh, the statute, I should say, modern courts, uh, lower courts, uh, have lost sight of what the statute says, what Congress was trying to accomplish, and what Congress was trying to accomplish. And I think that what Congress was trying to accomplish was reasonable, um, based on a long history of. Um, concern about corporate uh, power in this, in, in this country. So that would be uh, my, my, um, my argument for, this, for this, the margin standard. I do want to acknowledge, because I've gotten a lot of hostile emails from economists, that, um, <laughs> that under my standard, there would, you would block mergers that lower prices, okay? These are mergers that would lower prices but would raise uh, margins, meaning that they increase uh, uh, competition. Sorry, increase, uh, reduce competition. So uh, it would be a stricter standard, and there and fewer mergers would be uh, permitted. 
Um, so I know a lot of antitrust law is about promoting competition, but I think I'm going to resist the idea of us competing. Um, and it's sort of like I like I like a lot of these ideas. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, well, I think for me, I, I think uh, I, th I think uh, Stephen brings up a great point about sort of our, our proposal, where sometimes I feel like you know we propose something very radical, but at the same time, I think he makes a great point that it's like it's not that at all. I mean, under just the, a, a very classical view of like output means welfare. I mean, our our model fits that uh, in many places where we say look at these desperate effects. At the same time, are like output reducing and, and could fit just like a typical you know sort of antitrust analysis. So I, I think that's both a strength and maybe maybe a weakness. But I, and I, and in terms of agreeing, so one 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 idea that I've always really enjoyed, and I'm glad that was brought up, was also the idea of allowing, in a lot of times, uh, uh, like people to bargain collect, like allowing small uh, maybe buyers to to bargain collectively. I've, I've actually previously advocated for that in, uh, in in a lot of times the patent realm, where I've thought that when if there's maybe like an essential like a standard essential patent. And there's a threat of like you know a uh, holdup. I've I've said that you know the, the the licensees of patents should have should have power to come together and bargain if, if there is like a holdup game being used against them when they need to use this patent or the otherwise they can't exist in the market. I think that's a, and I think and if you look at legislatively how like labor has been allowed to do so shows I think that's a great way to almost like self order uh, you know sort of like effective competition. Uh, in the sense of that you don't need to go to court to do it. You just allow people to bargain together. I think it's a, I think it's a, so I, I appreciate, I really enjoy that, that, uh, uh, that proposal. And, and I am my only regret in writing the paper about this, just almost cabining it to sort of just patents and, you know, not you know, even thinking about that, you know, in a greater sphere. Cool. Look, I, I, yeah, I, th I think that these JNEs can be used as a merger remedy or mm -hmm. they can just be used, uh, you know, on, on their own. I mean, the other thing the agencies can do about um, about harm to vulnerable consumers is they can do it with, with case selection. Mm -hmm. You know, the FTC should be bringing case, supermarket cases, gasoline cases, banking cases, not trying to stop yacht mergers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, so, and, and John Baker and I have proposed that in an article some time ago. As for you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this criticism of economists, you can criticize Williamson, okay? Uh, but, you know, in, in 19, you know, at the time I started uh, in this game, economic, the economic attack on Bork was the only game in town. The people that were saying, oh, you shouldn't count economics, they were, they were already neutralized. And the leaders, Potofsky, Blake and, Blake and Jones, Eleanor Fox, they didn't want to reject economics. They wanted to take economics into account along with everything else. Yeah, I don't want so, to reject economics. So, yeah, so, yeah. It, yeah, so, so you I just too. want to reject the uh, consumer welfare standard. <laughs> well, and the problem with you guys is you adopted the consumer welfare standard. Well, I'm telling you, well, mistake. okay, yes, we, we got suckered. I okay. agree we got suckered. Okay. Right. That's that all I'm Bork saying. did. <laughs> Bork mislabeled Williamson. Yeah. It outraged us. Bob Land pointed out that it's about wealth transfer. I have an article, 2007, something like that, called the True Consumer Welfare right. Standard. And so, yeah, so we reified using economics. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, it was the only game in town. If uh, there was no other, there was no other grounds on which to fight. Uh, so. Um, so, so, so I've, got no, I've got no apologies. And you know, if you look at my article, along with the Dylan songs, there's like 50 citations to post-Chicago literature pushing back against your colleagues at Chicago and, and Bork and so on. I mean, the, don't blame us. Blame the lawyers. Blame the judges. <laughs> uh, I mean, the heavy, I in this, them too. the heavy in this game is Clarence Thomas. Okay, yeah, I mean, I we that. had Philadelphia National Bank. <laughs> Philadelphia National Bank was really solid. And if you look at the cases in the 80s, Hospital Corporation of America says, blame I'm going to defer blame to the blame FTC. Oh. Uh, okay. Elders Grain says, all doubts held against the, tr against the transaction. And then, out of whole cloth, 1990, Clarence Thomas says, oh, the Supreme Court, while well, they never said it explicitly, they've lightened the load. And so he turned, he lowered the standard from clear showing to more likely than not. 
uh, he, uh, he changed burden of proof to burden of production. And that's all she wrote. That's where it happened. It's okay, not. Let's, let's hear from these. OK. Yeah. So I actually wanted to use my moderator's privilege <laughs> to ask two lightning questions, and then we'll open it up. So um, just one question to Eric. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you would um, measure profit margins, um, because in some contexts it might be difficult to do so. And um, connected to that, I'm interested in how you relate your proposal to Herbert Hovenkamp's proposal on outputs. And in particular, I think it's really helpful. Your proposal seems to solve some problems in the labor context. At least um, it overcomes some of the remarks that were made this morning in the labor mergers um, panel regarding um, the fact that you could have um, more outputs and yet wages remaining low. And so that might lead to higher profit margins, and maybe your proposal solves that, but how do you calculate profit margins? And then a question to um, the two co-authors <laughs> is simply, um, why is your paper about antitrust, and so this is really a devil's advocate question because I'm very sympathetic to your proposal, but um, why is your proposal not something that should be dealt with through consumer law or discrimination law or some other branch of law? Okay, very quickly, um, so it's very hard to measure margins, and I, I'm happy to use the structural presumption when it's, pos when, you know, when it's uh, uh, possible to use the structural presumption. But what I have in mind are cases where economists uh, don't trust the, the structural presumption and think that another method like Guppy or uh, structural model should be used. Uh, in order to make price predictions. And as I understand it, in those cases, uh, they are already using margins because um, they need to in order to make price predictions. And so that, those would be situations where you should use margins rather than prices. You have that information anyway. I mean, merger prediction is hard because data is, you know, there's often not enough data, and that's just a generic problem with merger analysis. Uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I uh, overslept this morning and I missed the, uh, the labor panel, so I'll have to say uh, just this. Uh, and actually, I, I, I understand this better uh, because of Sanjukta's work. Um, and also Steve explained this to me uh, and a few other people. It, the, the cases are very clear that if uh, workers are harmed uh, as a result of anti-competitive behavior, there's an antitrust violation. And it doesn't matter, as Steve again, uh, whether uh, output goes up or down, or what it, the, the effect is on the other side of the market. And I think that's correct. Because um, after all, if you had it the other way around, where um, anti-competitive behavior harms consumers, it wouldn't matter. No one would care if the uh, firm shared its rents with uh, workers and wages went up. So that's just the way antitrust law works. It focuses uh, analysis on just one market. And, uh, and you don't have to worry about margins I mean, this is assuming we're sticking to prices or wages. So um, I don't think you need to use margins or to think about that to, to address that particular problem. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I mean, I think it's a really good question. And I think that I mean, the, when the easy answers are saying, well, you know, the, you know, you're not depriving the other areas of law. Uh, you're just adding one. But I think also, more importantly, uh, how I would see it, so a lot of times the, the actual so we, we can view it both from the terms of consumers and competitors. And I think one thing that made me really think more about this topic this way is so much of the times where you actually see, you know, sort of an intentional discrimination against things like docu undocumented immigrants or, or, or even recent immigrants is, is based upon the ideas of competition. Uh, I mean, there is, there is dating back to actually when uh, uh, antitrust or competition law uh, you know, sprung out of England hundreds of years ago. I mean, a lot of it was based upon the idea of foreign merchants or foreign traders were oftentimes excluded because there were, there were concerns about whether they, they pose unfair kinds of competition. For instance, oftentimes, like, like a lot of uh, times state action immunity, uh, uh, it allows municipalities or states to, uh, uh, to impose restrictions on things like on food vendors. And there's this, oftentimes there's a thought that they pose unfair types of competition. And a lot of the restrictions that we're talking about is competition, and it stems from competition. So in sort of a lot of aspects, I wanted 
I think it was fun for us to highlight just the nature of how uh, these issues aren't just tangentially related to competition and antitrust, but they actually strike very much at the heart of it. Okay, great. So we're opening it, you know, opening it up. Um, maybe we should take two questions at a time. So let's take the two here. So this is a comment and a quick question for Eric. So I think the vast majority, almost all merger analysis takes place setting aside efficiencies and at looking at effects, in which case there's no difference between your standard of price margin and looking at prices, because there's no change in cost. So until one gets to some showing of efficiencies, there's no difference. I see you're nodding. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so then I want to ask, suppose there is that rather tough showing for efficiencies. Again, this rarely happens, but we're in that little world. And let's say it's a six to five merger. There's two companies, maybe it's like a 10 and an 8% companies merge. And they um, show that they'll have these efficiencies that will lead to lower costs and lower prices. But they're not fully passing on the cost, so their margin goes up. Consumers benefit. The merging companies are happy they got the efficiencies. The rivals don't like it. That, you would say that's illegal, even though it, in, I would say as an economist, that's more competition is caused by the merger. You're going to say that's illegal under a statute because it substantially lessens competition, even though it led to more competition. Am I understanding you right, or am I mischaracterizing? Right. Yes, I'm getting you right. Okay, yeah. that's an interesting interpretation. So you, would of the you statute. say that like Herb about the two to one? If it was a two to one merger, what? No, a two to one merger. You got a monopoly. How could that? That obviously it, lessens it, it, competition. It lower, a two to one merger that lowers prices, or a three to two it, it, merger. Why is there the cliff? You know, when you go from a two to one to a three to two or to a four to three. Why, why does everything change? In my example, there was an increase in competition. You can't have an increase in competition when there's a monopoly. That doesn't make any sense. All right, so for a three to two merger and the price goes down, you would say there's an increase in competition? I think, I don't, yeah, I would be tend to say that because there's, there's but I understand there's, put it this way, we both have a challenge. Yeah, on no, both no, sides I think of this just you do. I, <laughs> 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 no. Uh, okay, but but all right. Let me let me let me. I would say to, yes for three to two. But I, I, I think, think two we. To one I think we. Right. We under, I think everybody understands. The the just two, two two things. The first thing is it's extremely rare in the courts. It's not at all extremely rare in the agencies. Like the agencies, I don't know. Maybe you know. I mean, the agencies think about efficiencies all the time in the enforcement. I'm sorry to hear you guys have strayed that way. It's not well, true in the Obama administration. Maybe it's true for the Biden you never, administration. You never did. OK. I don't know. Maybe somebody you know, like at a higher um, rank than I was can correct me. But anyway, that's, that's what I. The second point, though, is that, um, is that uh, 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 so right, just the, the, no, the, the only point I want to make is that um, uh, sorry, the first point is that I do believe that the agencies talk about efficiencies all the time. Forget about your experience and my experience. If you read, for example, in the, I think it's the Review of Industrial Organization, where people, I don't know whether it's you, but certainly frequently the former heads of, you know, the Bureau of Economics or so forth talk about the mergers they worked on over the previous years. It's efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. We didn't challenge this merger. By the way, there were, there's a lot of this stuff I, 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 I quoted in the paper I sent to you. The second point is that, um, um, is that when you say it's weird, it's because you're just focusing on the effect on customers, on the consumers. And the point I'm trying to make no, is- No, I'm not. I'm it's, not. No, no, you are. Because you're saying, look, the, the customers are paying a lower price. How could we possibly block this merger? And I'm saying the merger is increasing market power, in your hypothesis, that could have a negative effect on other people, non-customers, the people who are affected I by the Can't we the just go back to the statute? You're the guy who wants to go back to the statute. Pardon Less me? in competition or increase in competition. I just said Pardon me? increased competition. I'm not talking about but consumers. That's just definitional. You you're to saying it's no, Where you to disagree is on what competition is. Market power. <laughs> market power. That's my definition. Okay. You, you're you're de defining competition as lower price, which is, well, no, you're not. 
Anyway, okay. that, this is this is the nub of the disagreement. To be continued. Yeah, yeah. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> okay. Next question. I was going to ask this to the previous session, but I think there is a theme through many of the sessions we've had, where we each have our own favorite non-competition-related policy goal, which we find desirable. These things included lobbying, climate, forms of equity, democracy, which I'm happy to promote. I, I endorse many of these goals but it doesn't seem to me that the regulator has the authority or should in a democratic society be allowed to make these choices. So again, within, within the most recent presentation, I understand there's a range here. Some of it really is direct how competition affects different groups, but some of it seemed to stray from that a little bit. So should we be recommending that a regulator take considerations that the legislature did not include in the law? And if anyone else has a question, we're happy to take another one now. Oh, uh, actually, can, can we take Ioannis because he, he already had his hand up before. It's also the last point, but also the fact of um, you know, not basically taking into account these other values is also a policy choice. I mean, what actually and makes... Yeah, exactly. But the fact of pursuing, for instance, only efficiency, you know, Sorry. is also a policy yeah. choice. I mean, why should the regulator make that choice instead of the legislator who basically, you know, look into the different status, uh, in particular, you know, robinson Patman Act or Clayton Act or Sherman Act may have had other perspectives on just promoting efficiency. So, I mean, you know. Very, very possible, but it's unlikely that they might be a desirable policy, but it's not, likely, it's not likely in my mind that the legislature wanted to include that. Okay, so we're, we have a final round of conclusion remarks, answers, thoughts, anything, um, starting here. I hope you all liked my neo-Brandeisian proposal to allow small participants to form joint negotiation entities to count to collectively bargain in order to countervail the market power of large dominating firms. I, I think that is uh, something that it's just a proposal at this point. It's just a draft, but I think it's something that's worthy of consideration in this gilded age. What it amounts to is adopting an abuse of dominance prong for the Sherman Act. And, you know, that's not so crazy. Europe's got it. South Africa's got it. Canada's got it. So maybe we should consider it as well. Australia has collective bargaining for all small and medium sized businesses. Yeah, well, they don't have to be so small either. <laughs> OK. I like it, Steve, because I've mentioned it to you. Same. But Plus I want to give you I'll an give answer. I want to give you an answer to your question. The statute's actually pretty clear. It refers to substantial lessening of competition. The statute does not authorize the Justice Department to make policy. There are lots of statutes that do authorize agencies to make policy. This is not one of them. So all that the Justice Department can do is enforce a statute that blocks mergers that substantially lessen competition. A policy judgment that the Justice Department has made is not to enforce the statute when it results in harm to consumer surplus. So if you object to uh, agencies making policy, you should object to the consumer welfare standard. Interesting. So, uh, just again, I'm, I'm the outsider, and I just have to say, uh, I've been enjoying these conversations so much, but one conversation I, I sort of haven't heard is how do we make these ideas actually happen? Like, how do we implement? So, hopefully, that can be <laughs> part of the next conversation. You and Anna will implement <laughs> I guess, and, uh, I guess to finish off, and I, I also want to agree with, with a comment that Stephen just made that I think is very important. He said, like, you know, so much of this is about, like, what cases do does the DOJ or FTC bring? And I think that you, one thing that's cool is I think you are seeing a little movement there. I think it was two years ago, and again, these are just off the top of my head. Uh, wasn't there a criminal price-fixing case against for, like, canned tuna fish, like, uh, a couple years ago? But in that, the judge kind of cited this idea that's like, I think this is particularly bad, you know, because, I mean, this is something that is, that is the people who are eating canned tuna fish, you know, is, is, is not, you know, like lofty law professors oftentimes, but it, but it, it can't, <laughs> yeah. 
And, uh, and and so I think that is important. Because, and also part of like we've mentioned the case like Legion, you know, many times. It's incredibly important, like antitrust case. You know, but ultimately that's a case about like fancy artisan belts. You know, and then so many of like the cases that we talk about there are really important antitrust cases are just a really insignificant parts of the market. So I do I am sort of maybe enjoying the fact that antitrust might be going more in the direction of like yeah, let's look at Cantuna fish. That's a really important market to a lot of people versus like yachts and fancy artisan belts, and I think only Texas, I want to say, you know, it was, it was. Well, you know, for some reason it hasn't been mentioned over the conference, but the jockeys in Puerto Rico who faced a monopoly racetrack went on strike. They got sued under the per se rule for price fixing. Damages were levied against them. They took an appeal to the First Circuit saying the Clayton Act, Section 6 of the Clayton Act, exempts workers, even if they're not unionized, even if they're independent contractors, and they won. So that's a really important case uh, in terms of small participants bargaining together, if it survives the sinful six. <laughs> okay, so please join me in thanking all of the panelists. Uh, there's an important announcement. We're going to basically move directly to